Um, so I'm gonna, I, I will briefly touch on the, the points that Jason mentioned, but I'll spend more time on, on some unpublished work that we've got at the moment. Um, uh, the goal of our lab is really to, to develop tools around single cell genomics. Um, it's nice to be presenting this at a single cell proteomics meeting where I don't really have to justify the importance of, of measuring proteins in single cells. So um, looking forward to it. Uh, I just have to disclose as a, a co-inventor of, of, on, on IP that I indirectly can receive royalties based on, based on this work. So we were motivated into this work um, uh, joining joining the field of single cell RNA sequencing, essentially uh, seeing the, you know, the rapid growth in this field in the last decade or so, um, where increasing miniaturization, um, well, decreasing miniaturization, I guess, uh, has drastically in increased the throughput of cells that can be measured in these in these single cell uh, genomics assays. Um, the real increase in throughput has come in the last sort of four or five years, and and came about because of these methods that that really miniaturized the, um, the partitions that cells are put into, either through these nano droplet pico well, or even more recently, these in situ barcoding methods. But it's, it's really these nano droplet methods that are, that are the most commonly used and is commercialized by 10X Genomics and, and others, but really 10X Genomics dominates this, this space. Um, <clears throat> however, once you move into these types of methods, you lose information that you had in these more low through, throughput methods, which sort of refer to as addressability. So, knowing something about the cell uh, before it attains the barcode you're interested in. The, the, the actual identi the identity of which cell receives which barcode is lost in these very high throughput methods. Um, so just hold that thought for a minute. And I just wanna sort of start by comparing the, you know, these large scale single cell profiling technologies and, and just sort of contrasting single cell RNA sequencing with, with cytometry. And I'm, and I'm lumping flow and mass cytometry together here. So, RNA sequencing is, is unbiased in the sense that at least for poly A transcripts, you can theoretically capture any, any poly A transcript. But of course, you end up with a pretty sparse detection of, of a large number of markers. And, and this leads to high rates of dropout or, or just low sensitivity. Um, in contrast, these cytometry-based methods detect proteins for the most part, um, and you get a very robust detection of a, of a limited number of markers. Of course, it's biased in the sense that it's only the reagents that you put in the assay that you can detect. Um, and also your ability to multiplex measurements is limited by either the availability of fluorophores or metal isotopes or, or overlap in, in trying to measure these, um, measure these, uh, these markers. So our goal really when we started this was to couple protein readout with high throughput single cell RNA sequencing and effectively get the best of both of, but get the best of both of these worlds. And so this is, this is work that was pioneered by Marlon Stokius, who was a, who was a re senior research scientist in my group. He now actually works for 10X Genomics in, um, in Stockholm and is, is doing a lot of work on the, on the spatial transcriptomic or Visium platform. Um, a lot of really exciting work. I look forward to seeing what comes out. Um, so just to outline the talk, I'm gonna briefly go over SiteSeq and mention a few different methods that are based around this, this same technique. Um, spend most of the time on unpublished data. And then at the end, I'll mention ASAPSeq, which is a you know, brand new uh, method that we've, that we've just been working on um, and uh, I hope to spend some time on that towards the end. So the way SiteSeq works and the, the initial sort of the aha moment was, was realizing that, that we could couple protein detection with single cell RNA sequencing by appending an oligo to antibodies that sort of looks a bit like a transcript. So if it's got a poly A tail, just like an mRNA transcript, then there's an antibody barcode and, a, and an amplification handle. So in these high throughput single cell RNA sequencing methods, the poly T primers, which still is used in most of these methods, will anneal, reverse transcription will make a copy of the, of the DNA barcode. It, it works off with DNA as a template as well. Um, and you copy this antibody barcode uh, and the PCR handle for later amplification. Um, and a really important point is that the barcode space is essentially infinite. So in a very short space, you can make as many barcodes as you like, and it will certainly exceeding the number of, of available antibodies. And what this potentially allows you to do is to do unlimited multiplexing, because of course, detection is not limited by overlap either. If you design these barcodes appropriately with decent edit distance between them, there's really no issue with, with overlap. So this is how it looks if you take, take these uh, stained cells that have been stained with these, with these uh, antibody oligo reagents, you wash the cells to remove unbound antibodies and then you encapsulate and do a single cell RNA sequencing experiment essentially. So in the droplet 
both the cells poly A RNA and the poly A oligos that come from the come from the antibodies will associate with these barcoded oligos from the microparticle. Uh, reverse transcription will happen, and you can then make your libraries. Um, a, a kind of a, a nice feature of this is that that normally when you make these cDNA libraries, you do a you do a size selection where you, you remove all the, the low molecular weight products. Um, that's where these protein tags are. So we don't make any compromise to the quality of the cDNA library by sort of siphoning off these small these low molecular weight products from which we get the protein tag information. And so this is going back to the original publication on this where we did site seek on, on human blood. This is cord blood. Um, we see all the major populations. This is clustered by RNA sequencing. Um, and we just have a relatively small by today's standards panel of about uh, 13 markers that we, that we stain these cells with. And this is sort of the distribution that we'd expect these markers to be, to be present in. And indeed, this is, this is what we see. So if you look on the right hand side now, we have uh, in blue is the, is the um, mRNA transcript for each of these markers. And the cognate protein is, is uh, shown in, in green underneath. Um, and you can see that at the cluster level, we're in pretty much broad agreement. So you know, CD4, for instance, is enriched uh, in, in uh, T cell and monocyte clusters. Um, and you can see that protein is also there, um, just as a, as a single example. Um, but some features that are really important here is, is just how robust the protein detection is compared to the RNA detection. So, you know, CD3 again is a good, CD4 is a good example, CD56 is another, where we can see that while it is clear that, that it's a uh, detection of its RNA is enriched within this NK cell cluster, it's actually probably in about 10% of cells that you actually see uh, CD56 RNA. This is in contrast to the protein where you see robust protein detection in all the cells and in fact, you can even see a subset of cells that have brighter expression of CD56, which actually corresponds to a biologically meaningful population of CD56 bright NK cells. Um, and so you can see just looking at the various markers here, everything sort of highlights the different cell types as you expect them to. So that's sort of the overview of SiteSeq and how it works. Um, pretty soon after we developed this, we, we realized that we could again borrow from the cytometry field and, and use sort of a, a, a related idea for this to, to sort of overcome some of the limitations with, of single cell RNA sequencing, um, most notably just how expensive it is. Um, and so we developed this method that we call cell hashing. So taking the same concept as, uh, as SiteSeq, but in this case, instead of looking at differentially expressed proteins, looking at proteins that are ubiquitous on the cell surface and we could basically use to label, to paint a sample, paint every cell in a sample, um, we develop these hashtags. So these are different oligonucleotides that you, know, as you, you label sample A, sample B, sample C with different, with different um, barcodes. Then you can pull the samples together, encapsulate them in droplets, library prep sequence, and then you can de uh, demultiplex the cells based on which dominant hashtag they, they, they express. Um, importantly here, and, and as I mentioned, sing RNA sequencing is expensive. These commercial assays especially are very expensive. Um, and these methods rely on Poisson loading of cells. And so the more cells you load, you, the more cells you get out, but also the more doublets you get out, which can be, you know, can mess up a lot of different experiments. However, with hashing, you can actually, a large proportion of the, of the doublets you can, you can detect because you see collision of different hashtags. And so you can informatically remove these at, at a later point. Um, this is just to show what, uh, and, and sorry, I should say that means that then you can load a lot more cells in, get more single cells out. And, and sort of, we, we, we estimate it's about four to five times the number of single cells you can get out of an individual experiment compared to the manufacturer's recommendations. So this is what it looks like. This is an experiment with eight different samples hashed together. You can see the eight major clusters, but you also see the 28 um, doublet clusters, which you'd expect from, from collision of eight different samples. Cells are distributed broadly across all uh, cell types, so we're not seeing the, the hashing procedure doesn't doesn't ruin the experiment in any way. We certainly don't see any decrease in sensitivity, and this heat map on the right just sort of shows how how on off the signal is. That it's really when, when done properly, you can really see very clearly um, if a cell has a hashtag or not. Um, so getting into the unpublished work now. So that what we've shown so far, especially with SiteSeq, is really um, showing cells clustered by RNA and then projecting protein on top of them, which is, which is nice and it's, you know, totally useful. 
but um, we reasoned that there's probably a better way to, to, to make use of this data, especially as the number of proteins that we're interrogating at once increases. So we you know, argue that the whole may be greater than the sum of the parts if we can use both the RNA and the protein information to tell T cell types apart. And this is, uh, you know, we're really fortunate to be, to work on the same floor as Rahul Satija and his group. We have, you know, many longstanding collaborations. And this, this is one led by Yuan Hao, who's really an excellent um, uh, post, uh, grad student in Rahul's lab uh, on the computational side and Stephanie Hao, uh, no relation to Yuhan, uh, who is uh, leading the wet lab work on my side. So just to sort of walk you through how this integration works, if we take a toy data set, in, in this case, this is the actual same data set I showed a couple of slides ago, we cluster by RNA or cluster by protein, there's a few features that you can see that are a bit different. So firstly, the RNA is, uh, you see you don't actually see that, that greater separation between CD4 and CD8 T cells based on RNA, um, but you do see a very small cluster of, of red blood cells. If you look in protein, you see fantastic separation of CD4 and CD8 T cells, but the red blood cells are nowhere to be seen, which isn't surprising. We just didn't have the markers for them in this, in this experiment. So th the way that the integration that, that Yuhan and Rahul have, have pioneered works is to take an individual cell, say a target cell here in, in blue, and then look at, look at its K nearest neighbors um, and look at them in both RNA space and in protein space. And so zooming in here on the right, just to try and make it a bit more obvious, I hope you can see that if you look in RNA space, that you know, most of the time you will, the, the neighbors you pick will also be CD8 T cells. And so we'll predict nicely what gene expression is happening in that cell. But some of the time it will stray and it will detect CD4, CD4 T cells. Whereas in protein space, um, it really every, every, market, every cell that's a near, near neighbor to this, um, to this blue cell will, will also be a CD8 T cell. So you can look at this if you, if you think, you know, take the measured, measured protein for, any, for each and every protein in the data set, and then look at the predicted protein based on what you would predict based on the neighbors of, of that particular cell. And you can see for CD8 in protein space, the, the prediction is very good. However, in RNA space, it's not so good. There's cells here on the axis that it clearly gets wrong. And just to show we're not completely biased towards proteins, the, the, the you know, cognate example is that in, in uh, the yeah, hemoglobin A, RNA, um, uh, hemoglobin 1 RNA, RNA does a good job of predicting, whereas protein does a very poor job of predicting. So the question really is how important is each modality for, um, uh, for predicting for each cell? Um, and we can determine cell specific weights and, and use this to derive a joint representation. And so this is just the, the, the data from the previous slide showing that you know, protein, is measured, protein measures CD8 well, or predicts CD8 well, RNA predicts uh, uh, hemoglobin well, um, and this joint representation is, is useful then at reconstructing both modalities. And so for each individual cell, you get a specific weight of RNA or protein. So um, we're pleased to see that this joint classification improves clustering of cell states. And so again, this is just the data from the early stage, uh, so presented from the early slide, the same data presented with joint clustering here. And I want you to take away that you can see CD4 and CD8 are very clearly distinct cell types here compared to in RNA space. Um, and importantly, the end, it was something that we weren't even looking for, but the NK cells separate themselves out into CD8 high and low. So you can see here in the circle, whereas in, uh, at the top here, uh, they're, they're completely intermingled with each other. So this is just sort of a, a, an example for illustration. Where we're going now is to perform site-seq with extremely large protein panels. And, and this is some work, uh, again, with, with Rahul and, and, and Yuhan, um, where we've taken a, a much larger number of human PBMCs from four different donors, stained with a, a very large antibody panel. So we work very close with BioLegend here, um, and they've been fantastic at generating these reagents and sharing them. Uh, and this is all processed on 10X Genomics V3. And if we cluster cells by either RNA or protein, you can see that you, know, you get decent clustering as you'd expect, but there's sort of a more of a continuum between different clusters um, in, in either RNA or protein space. Whereas I hope you can see in, in the joint representation, it sort of seems to be more discrete. Um, and if I go to the next slide and sort of, this is just the joint representation expanded out with the, with the clusters um, uh, revealed by color, um, you can see we have quite a lot of um, uh, detail here, but if we actually reveal what each are, um, you can see we actually have extremely you know, detailed uh, resolution or a very high resolution of all these different clusters of cells.
especially in T cells, um, which our panel is somewhat biased towards T cells, so it's not too surprising. But we really see very large numbers of clusters of T cells that recapitulate virtually every type of cell type that we could look up. So every cluster here, when we look at different differentially expressed protein or RNA markers, makes sense based on what we've what we've seen in the literature. So um, I just want to show as well that you know, beyond just sort of a, a, a pretty UMAP with lots of different clusters, we actually see some things that we couldn't otherwise see. So an example here is Treg cells, which we, you know, we don't always see with, with RNA sequencing alone, sometimes depending on how good the data set is. Um, but in this case, when we use RNA and protein markers for identification, we get a very, very clear cluster of Treg cells that are popping out the side here. And you can see that you know, these two canonical transcript markers of Tregs are, are, are enriched in this cluster, but themselves, they're not strong enough to, to, to separate these, these cell types out. A second example is this integrin CD49A. And to be honest, we don't really know what these cell types are. Um, from what we read, they're, you know, usually, cells expressing these are usually, usually associated with tissue residents. And we can see that in the joint representation, we see these two different clusters um, uh, one in the CD4 cells and one in the CD8 cells um, that are you know, highly enriched for CD49 protein. But we don't see these clusters appearing at all, e either with RNA or protein alone. So it, you know, it's giving us more confidence that we're seeing uh, things that we can't see otherwise if we just make single modality measurements. Okay, so I'll go through now um, briefly Excite 6. So this is something that Jason alluded to in, in, in the introduction. Um, Everything I've talked about so far is using three prime uh, barcoded RNA sequencing methods and sort of highlighted here on the right with 10X being dominant, but drop, seek, in drop, et cetera. Um, 10X Genomics also has a product that they call their immune profiling kit or the five prime kit, which essentially just flips things around. It puts the barcode on the five prime end of the transcript as opposed to the three prime end of the transcript. And you end up with a five prime tag uh, gene expression library but you can also enrich for these five prime variable genes, which is why it's the immune profiling kit, uh, such as the B and T cell receptor uh, genes. And importantly to note that this works differently because the RT primer itself is not barcoded, it's just soluble and you add it to the master mix. It's the, it's the template switch oligo that is, that's barcoded and is on the gel beads. So to make SiteSeq compatible with this method, it was really just a simple matter of switching the, the poly A handle, oh, sorry, the poly A capture sequence on, on our antibody reagents to a, a sequence that's complementary to the 13 nucleotides of the, of the switch sequence from, from 10X. Um, and I won't get into this, this, this worked. We made a bunch of antibodies, uh, Biologin now sells these as total 6C antibodies. For this audience, I'm not going to go into the clonotype work at all, except to show that you can get clonotypes, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Um, what I want to show is that we can use this method to, uh, to do functional genomics uh, of single cells. And so I mentioned that the RT primer is soluble here. So it's designed for you know, poly A uh, tagged RNAs, but there's no reason you can't put additional oligonucleotides in there. And, and a candidate RNA molecule that we wanted to detect that was not polyadenylated is, is obviously a, 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 a Cas9 uh, guide RNAs for, for CRISPR screens which are invariant at the three prime end, but are variable at the five prime end, which is the, re the reason you, you want to sequence so you know which guide is doing the perturbation. Um, so we thought this was a good way of doing a single cell CRISPR screen. Uh, there, are, there were other methods out there at the time. Um, all of them, all the methods that were out there at the time rely on sequencing the guides by a proxy. So it's engineering a way that there's a poly, uh, a poll two generated poly A transcript that reports on the guide sequence. Um, this has some limitations in terms of having to make specialty libraries and, and especially the, the methods on the left, left here had some um, since well publicized um, uh, issues with, with the guide barcode sequence becoming dissociated from the or re recombining and becoming dissociated from the, from the guide sequence itself. Um, so, uh, but this direct capture of guide RNA, we, you know, if we, if we take cells here and we cluster by the guide RNA that they express, we get, to, we get extremely high guide detection. Uh, these POL3 express transcripts are very, very highly expressed, so they're very easy, easy to detect. Um, we can measure uh, phenotypes at both the RNA level and at the protein level when we have, when we have protein reagents for that particular transcript. Um, and this sort of, I think, this, this plot here nicely shows that if we order cells based on their, their guide RNA expression and look 
at individual cells and also in, in ensemble, if you look at the, the rolling median here, um, you can see a very clear uh, protein phenotype. Uh, you know, there, there's an RNA phenotype as well, but at the single cell, cell level, it's much more variable. Um, and uh, indeed, if we, if we do sort of a, you know, look to see how many observations we need for a particular perturbation to see a phenotype, if we're measuring by RNA, even the most strong guide for this particular um, uh, gene, CD46 here, it still takes us you know, 50 to, to 100 genes to, to see a statistically significant decrease in that gene's expression. Um, whereas looking at protein expression, even the worst performing guides, you know, with very low numbers of cells, we can, we can, see, um, we can see an effect. Um, and you know, this is a sort of toy example. Again, we have a single guide looking at a single gene or a single protein. In reality, we, we see this as being uh, powerful for, for screens where you have a, a large variety of the different um, markers. You're, 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 looking at, you're looking at the phenotype in terms of a gene expression signature rather than downregulation of a particular gene. And Rahul's lab is actually, uh, Effie Papalexi from Rahul's lab has just recently put out a really nice preprint uh, on this, looking at um, uh, factors involved in um, uh, immunotherapy. Um, so just to summarize ExciteSeq, this is expanded CRISPR compat compatible ExciteSeq, essentially in this one assay, it's, it's modular. You can choose what you want to measure and what you don't want to measure, but essentially all these modalities here on the right-hand side are things that you can measure and, and actually in a separate um, uh, effort that I'm not going to talk about here, led by Nick Skarakis uh, and Stephanie from my group, um, we can detect MHC tetramers and, and, and to tetram binding to T cells and also recover the T cell sequence. So it's actually quite a, a useful technique in that respect. Okay, to summarize SiteSeq and the extensions, I hope I've shown you that if you integrate protein and RNA, you get enhanced information. You can enhance cellular phenotyping. You can multiplex cells by hashing. Uh, we've made these methods compatible with both three prime and five prime technologies. And you can do functional, single cell functional genomics by capturing uh, guide RNA sequences directly. The last little bit I'm gonna talk about is this is new method that we'll hopefully be posting relatively soon, um, where, we, where we teamed up with Life Ludwig and um, Caleb Leroux from Vijay Sankar and, and, and Aviv Regev's labs uh, at the Broad Institute um, and come up with a new method we call ASAPSeq. And I'll get into that in just a second. So I wanted to, introduce ATAC-seq here. I'm sure the audience is aware of ATAC-seq, uh, the assay of transposes accessible chromatin by sequencing. The basic concept is that um, uh, this TN5 transposase can attack the DNA um, and insert these, its payload, which are, which are designed to be sequencing adapters. Um, you then perform a PCR and you recover whichever fragments you recover. But of course, it's, it's only the DNA that's accessible to the transposase that you recover fragments from. So you end up with you know, something a profile like this where you get these you know, uh, peaks of, of reads in either nucleosome free regions such as this you get mononucleosome fragments that, that span individual nucleosomes and you even get sort of more detailed information such as uh, footprints where transcription factors or other or other uh, dna binding proteins have sat and protected those fragments from from uh, tagmentation and in recent years, this is this, while well, this started out as a bulk method, it's, it's become a single cell method by a variety of different methods, either combinatorial indexing, microfluidics, nanowells, or more recently droplet based methods. Um, and it, but it, I want to point out it's an extremely sparse uh, data set, but almost by definition, um, th this is sort of a, you know, a toy example of what it looks like, but it's essentially a digital readout. Um, and the reason for that is, of course, the sensitivity of these methods is dependent on the copy number of what you're trying to measure. Um, and in a diploid human cell, there's only two copies of each DNA locus. This is different than mRNAs, which of course has, has some sort of endogenous amplification where you have maybe single digits to hundreds of molecules of, per transcript per cell. And then you get maybe a two to three log increase between mRNAs and their cognate proteins. And so, you know, I think to make it really simple, we think RNA plus protein is good because proteins make up the sparsity of RNA. We think attack plus protein will also be good because proteins really should make up for the ultra sparsity of, of, of chromatin accessibility measured by ATAC-seq. So how we came to this was we, we saw a talk by, by Caleb actually, who came and, gave a, came and gave a talk about this new method that their group had developed, uh, deliberately trying to retain mitochondrial uh, uh, DNA reads in their ATAC-seq libraries. And for a long time, mitochondrial reads were the bane of people's existence doing ATAC-seq because they wasted sequencing reads. 
these guys realized that they could use high coverage sequencing of mitochondrial genomes for, for determining, determining clonal architecture of cells in a population. So they played around with a variety of different methods to increase the, the, the fraction of reads that came from the mitochondrial genome. And so they were able to increase it from an you know, average of about 10, uh, 10x genome coverage to almost 200x coverage. And the way they did this was by fixing and permeabilizing whole cells before performing the, the tagmentation reaction. And so when we heard this, we're like, well, that's handy. Maybe we can uh, fix and permeabilize uh, cells, but before we do that, we can stain them with our antibodies and capture surface proteins as well. So um, this is exactly what we did. We uh, stain these cells with a, with a panel of our, of our uh, regular site-seq antibodies. We fixed and lysed and then performed TN5 transposition. I'm not going to go into the real comple complexities of the detail here, but we early on we realized that we didn't want to redesign all these antibodies and oligos, so we devised a strategy where we can uh, spike in a bridging oligo that during the labeling reaction will enable us to convert oligos that were, were site seek reagents that we've used for site seek into reagents that can be captured by a tax seek. And so just this bridging strategy really, really works well. And what it means is if, if anyone is interested in doing this assay, you just need to order a single oligo from IDT and, and, and you're away. So these, the cell or the, the, the nuclei or cells, I should say, um, go through the 10X chromium attack uh, platform and within droplets both the uh, the antibody tags and the and the, and the uh, tagmentation the tagmented tags from from uh, the attack seek assay um, are barcoded and share the same cell barcode and so we can cluster cells by chromatin accessibility and look at protein expression uh, in this uh, on these clusters and, and we see for this very canonical TBNK panel that's been put out by Biolegend. so these are nine very canonical markers they decorate all the major cell types in, in the, that, that we see in this, in this experiment. And for the most part, this, this uh, agrees very nicely with gene activity scores as measured by, by a taxi shown here on the bottom. So we're confident this works and we call it the attack with select antigen profiling by sequencing or ASAP-seq. Um, to head off what is normally the first question we get anytime we give a site-seq talk, um, which is, can you detect intracellular proteins? This is great if you can get cell surface, but there's a lot going in, on inside. We agree. We spent a lot of time trying to get intracellular site-seq to work. Um, but we reasoned that we're actually probably a better shot with, with ASAP-seq because the, the actual, the main analyte that we want to measure from a cell being, being chromatin accessibility is probably a little more hardy to fixation and lysis than, than um, cytoplasmic RNAs. So we stained with extracellular markers, we fixed, and then we stain with uh, fixed and permeabilized, then we stain with intracellular markers, performed ASAPC, clustered cells by, by chromatin accessibility. And if you look on the right here, you can see that extracellular markers stain the cell types they should. You can see CD8 and CD4 in non-overlapping subsets of T cells, CD16 here in, in some of the, in these NK cells. And we actually see for these three different um, intracellular markers, we see expression patterns as you'd expect them to, to, to be. Um, we wanted to make use of some of the other uh, advantages that ASAP-seq gives us. And so we performed ASAP-seq on bone marrow. Um, this is a, uh, and, and so this enables us to catch, capture accessible chromatin, also mitochondrial mutations and measure antibody tag abundances. So we can cluster cells again, based on chromatin accessibility. We see all the major cell types we'd expect. We can uh, look at different protein markers here. Again, T cells, monocytes, B cells, uh, erythrocytes, or so erythroid cells, uh, and then some precursors here. Um, but then we can also do things like look at um, particular, uh, we, can, we can see what sort of mitochondrial mutations are present in the sample and at what percent heteroplasmy. Look and see that there are, there's a particular one that seems to exhibit a, a bias in particular clusters, and so there might be a lineage effect here. Um, but then we can also do things like look at, uh, look at, um, look at pseudo, pseudo time trajectory, trajectory, I should say, of, of monocytes here. So the differentiation from precursor cells to monocytes. Um, and we can look at all the different markers that we have in our experiment. In this case, 240 different markers. We can see that 60 of them here cluster really nicely and have these, have these really nice expression patterns over the course of, of myeloid differentiation. Um, a last little experiment I want to talk about, I'm just about to run out of time here, is uh, realizing that we can, because we're using the same reagents for antibody detection, 
that we can actually perform ASAP seek and site seek on, on the same sample. And so to show this, we, we used a T cell stimulation well, or a PBMC stimulation model where we, where we stimulated PBMCs with uh, CD3 and CD28 antibodies for 16 hours and then stay, staying with a panel of 227 different uh, site seek antibodies took an aliquot of the cells and performed site seq for RNA and protein. And then for the remainder, we fixed, analyzed, and performed ASAP seq for, for chromatin accessibility in protein. And we were really pleased to see that the protein detection is equivalent in site seq and ASAP seq. So this is showing the, the, the fold change in all these protein markers uh, upon stimulation um, uh, on the, on the x-axis as measured by ASAP seq and on the y-axis as measured by site seq. And you can see that the correlation is extremely strong um, and, and really, you know, we, we, this made us very confident that, um, that, that it's essentially an equivalent measurement. Um, that the protein measurement is essentially equivalent between the two methods. And so what this enables us to do is to do these integrated analyses across the central dogma, essentially. And so this is a, sort of a pseudo bulk plot here of T cells, where you can see uh, you know, change in RNA on the X axis, protein on the Y axis, and, and chromatin accessibility on the, on the color axis here. And so you can look for any, any one particular marker and see how they change in the course of stimulation. And a couple of just choice examples shown here where you can see the drastic decrease in CD3 uh, protein upon stimulation uh, and, and the drastic increase in, in, um, in CD69 upon stimulation. And you know, in some cases, in most cases, the chromatin changes in the experiment are more subtle, but we can, we can detect some, some cell type specific changes in chromatin and RNA or protein. So I just sort of leaves it, you know, we, we consider asap seq and site seq to be these companion assays that you know, overlap, the, the Venn diagram overlaps perfectly on the proteins as we, we can literally use the same reagents to measure the same proteins at the same time, but we can get information that spans the central dogma by combining these two assays. So uh, with that, I'd just like to thank the people in my lab who, who did the work and collaborators. So Eleni has really led uh, excite seq and, and asap seq from, from, my, from my lab side. I mentioned Marlon earlier. Stephanie's had a lot to do with uh, many of these different projects. Um, uh, I'd like to thank our collaborators. Uh, SightSeek, I've mentioned Marlon especially. Rahul for a lot of the follow-up work that we've been doing. Uh, Sergey Neville for ExSightSeek. And for ASAPSeek, it's been this great collaboration really led by Caleb and Life. Um, uh, uh, it's been a really enjoyable collaboration. Um, funding, I'd like to thank the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and, and the NHGRI. And of course, we really couldn't do you know, any of the sort of large scale stuff we've done without BioLegend, who've been a really fantastic partner in this and have taken this and, and run with it. Um, we maintain this website, sitesite.com, where we answer a lot of different questions and try and put up as much information as we can and update as things progress. Um, and if you've yeah, got any questions, please, please hit us up. Thanks for your time.